So, <coughs> well, okay. <laughs> she wants me to tell the story we were talking about there at supper this evening. Uh, a couple of the old <coughs> miners that was around here. Jack Hamus came back from World War One and been gassed. And uh, he was told he would have to stay outdoors. So Jack prospected everything from the Colorado line to Cuesta, all of this area up through here. And uh, then uh, Tom Gill used to prospect too on all of it. And so Jack and Tom and, and uh, gee, I can't think of the other fellow's name, had been over on the side of Baldy prospecting. And uh, I mean on a, well, excuse me, on Wheeler Peak. And when they started back there was a real bad storm came up and they were camped over on the head of the Columbine apparently. So in coming back from this storm, the lightning when you if you're up above Timberline and there's ever any lightning, the static electricity is atrocious <coughs> up there. It'll make your hair curl on the back of your neck or sting and you try to find a cave or a hole or a couple of rocks you can crawl under and get down just as low as you can because I've seen balls of fire hit up there on Gold Hill, about yay big around, come down and hit, and then just roll out, out across the rocks. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, they hit one of those storms and it really, really poured down rain on them and they was trying to get back to their camp. Somewhere coming back through there where Jack Hamus slipped, his feet slid out from under him and he slid down on his rear end and he said when he got to Looking around the flash of lightning, I saw it was kind of a odd colored dirt, kind of a blue-gray dirt. So he said he just picked up a couple of handfuls of the mud and stuck it in his slicker pocket. So my brother and I, after the storm had cleared up a little bit, we was fishing up the Columbine and got up there and ran onto their camp. And of course they wanted us to sit down and have coffee and eat. They had a pot of beans on and was trying to get everything dried out. And we got to talking, and old Jack says, hey, he said, you know, I never did look at that. He said, in my slicker, he said, uh, I'm over here, and it was hanging on a bush. He said, I'll go get that and take a look at it. So he went over and got his slicker and pulled it off of the bush and, and got a handful of that mud or dried mud out and looked at it. And he said, well, it don't look like it did when it was wet. And uh, so he said, well, he said, let's just pan it and see what it is. So he dumped it out of his slicker pockets and put it in a gold pan. We all went down to the creek down there. And, Jack panned it out, and would you believe there were several little nuggets in it and a little stream of nice fine gold all the way around. <laughs> Boy, we decided we were going up there and get rich right quick, so we, <laughs> we all headed back up on the side of, we don't know where it was on the side of Gold Hill or where it was on the side of Wheeler. They don't know where they were at when the lightning was But they hunted all summer, and my brother and George and I was up and helped them. They camped up there in the head of Columbine all summer. We never did find that spot where he picked that up. That was still there. Right? And I've hunted for it since in Dead Mind. So, John, Miller, you want to tell your story? He had one story. I made him sit up here for that one story. I thought more of that since then. Oh, good. Well, we used to go to Amarillo on vacation. Though, we got back to Amarillo and we were going through stuff, the rocks that the kids had brought back. And, we had a, a real nice gold nugget that ended up in Amarillo. <laughs> we don't know where it came from. It was a piece of quartz that <coughs> shot through with wire gold. Yeah. But there, there was other rushes up here in Red River, and one was the famous Red River uranium rush. Nobody's heard of it. <laughs> this is all I got out of it, uranium rush. Uh, Dr. Chambers, that built the Star Trading Post, had an idea that we should go over all these old mine dumps with a Geiger counter. And I had a Jeep and a Geiger counter. We headed for the infernal mine first because we heard the miners were <coughs> burning their hands and it was supposedly radioactive. <laughs> we went over the infernal mine dump and that Geiger counter didn't even click. <laughs> Proceeded to go over every mine dump in the Red River Valley. Finally, we went over one at Bitter Creek the old Indeman mine, and this was just a Geiger counter. All it did was click. It didn't tell you how much. And anyhow, that Geiger counter just went wild up there. So Dr. Chambers and I filed a uranium mine. Up. <laughs> <laughs> that's where Brian O'Brien has his claim up there now. He's on the <laughs>
he, he's claimed he's got silver knives and terrarium oxide. <laughs> rhodium. Rhodium. Oh, yeah, rhodium. rhodium. I forgot that. <laughs> we, we boxed up a, yeah. we boxed up a sample of this and sent it off. In the meantime, our claim was jumped. <laughs> Took down all our markers and put up his own markers. And, and we just... We had Endeman's description of the mine, and we just refiled it under that description, but it really wasn't tied to anything, so it could have been anywhere. <laughs> Meantime, the assay came back, and it was one-tenth of one percent uranium, which was hardly economical. <laughs> My sample was lower than that when I got it back. <laughs> was that in the 50s, John? In the 50s. Okay. So you talked about Pioneer, you talked about... Uh, Lake Road area? Class of four. Class of four. What about Midnight and LaBelle? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, that's where the Memphis Mine was, Bitter Creek. The Memphis Mine was the Krishners. Uh, were there. C.C. Lowe was up Bitter Creek. Independent was up Bitter Creek. John Murphy was up Bitter Creek. Pete Del Orso in the bend of the canyon. Pete Del Orso was up Bitter Creek. And, all, and in Pioneer. And both. in Pioneer. We both. And in Bitter Creek, when you go above Beaver Park for the where they stop you now. When you go up a little farther, the, road, the canyon bends to the left where you go to the Memphis Pine, and the little, the little canyon right on the right, as I recall, is the June Buck Canyon. And I, was all, I always assumed that that tied in somehow to June Buck Miller, but I wasn't really sure. What about the Orofino? Do you know anything about it? No. The Orofino was a bit of me, but I don't know. It was uh, operated in the early days. It was known as the Big Five Mine. And Lowe is the one that uh, called it the Orofino, and Lowe married one of the Cisneros Bureau of Women down in Cuesta. That's how the Cisneros have the Orofino, and they named it uh, that because of the fine gold. And there is, in that uh, clay formation there at the Orofino, there is some fine gold. I can color out of that. Where's the Orofino? the Orofino. Where, where is it located though? Where is it? Uh -huh. it's, <laughs> it's down the Bitter Creek Canyon from the... Uh, Between uh, here and there. <laughs> and it joins the Scarvada claims down there. Above, above. You mean it's above it, Bob? It's just above the above, yeah. yeah. Above the Scarvada claims. Uh -huh. I imagine the Forest Service has all these maps and everything. Else. I was just going to say, if, if you haven't been to the Oral Fino <laughs> and you can get to it, you can drive within a short distance walk the, the last little bit. It's really worth your time to go there. There are some fabulous things you can see. First of all, there's a very small uh, wooden water wheel there. But even, <coughs> even more exciting, there's this huge boiler that is still there in absolutely perfect shape. And isn't this the boiler that theoretically brought itself in over land? They fired it up with wheels on it. Town. Yeah, yeah. It's really worth the time to go. You can drive up Cabresto Canyon from, from Cuesta, get very close to it, and then we'll just walk in the last little bit. It's really worth the time. What about these boilers from, uh, I understood it, they come through Mena Valley. They come through Bobcat right up here. They went down the road that's still there. They come through Bear Creek, down into the bottom of Bear Creek. They went up, I think they call it Lost Canyon or Lost Road. Lost and Trail Canyon. Lost right? Trail. And you can still see the cable marks on those trees where they wished themselves or just pulled them up there onto the top. Now they'd run the cable out and tie around a tree and then get steam up in the boiler and the winch pull itself on up to that tree and then they'd take the cable and go on up to the next tree and and that's the way they brought it all the way from E-Town. It took almost a, all summer, wouldn't it? <laughs> so. that, that road that goes down Bear Canyon still is in pretty good shape. Right? The hiked it just old drag years. bucket that they used, they rigged a pole or had a tree up there, and it was guide off four directions, and they had a, had a uh, set of grizzly, well, uh, <coughs> the uh, ore bin, and they would run this big bucket down into the uh, Bitter Creek Canyon, into the creek. And then they'd use the steam to pull it back up, bring it up and dump it over into that grizzly. And then below that, they would take out the finer stuff and the first stuff would go over. And they had bars that were open within three quarters or to an inch apart. And uh, that's the drag bucket that's over here in City Park. Okay. Uh, I, I 
I've hunted on a, a right off the Monarch Pass on the mountain up there, and there's holes dug all over that mountain. And I've never hunted in this area. Is as many holes dug back in the ground as that was over there. I could believe just about the same. And there was an old boiler up there too. I seen you know. <coughs> a lot of the construction cover has been filled in. The first, a lot of a lot of, a lot of the, the oil mine. The added like right the, here at the Ajax, the or jumping jack. Jumping jump jump jack was filled in. The New York Tunnel there in the Mount of Pioneer was a homelip tip that was filled in. Yeah, was the forest service closed on the end down here. Pardon? Double tunnel right here. Yeah, that was the jumping jack. Yeah. We used to play there as kids. Yeah. I imagine yeah. Nick Dennis, Dennis and I played it there, haven't we, Dennis? Right here by Buck Deer Lodge. Yeah. Yeah. Caved in. And there's another behind the schoolhouse that's caved in. That was another behind uh, where Georgie Warner had that property on. Uh, the high street at the far end. Boy. There were there were tunnels there. It was the Ethel behind the schoolhouse, isn't it? The Ethel mine, right behind the school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right behind the you know, I'm not sure if that was. Was that the name of it, the Ethel? Yeah, just that, that's the plains. Yeah, that's that, the plains. Uh, Esther. 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 I think. Yeah, I think <coughs> that sounds more like it. Yeah. Uh -huh. the Mo, the Mo family. And they talk about all the tunnels and everything, but. I don't think anybody's mentioned about the classic mines that's been around here. If you go out and ride around and look, you'll see where there's indications of old classic mines. Pioneer, Goose Creek, Bear Creek, West Fork of Red River. Classic Creek. Classic Creek. mines. And especially there in Bear Canyon, I don't think that nobody's ever looked in there, but uh, on the, right up the mouth of it, you can see how much work those guys have done moving that rock by hand. And there must have been gold there that she wouldn't have done that much work. A plastic creek the same way, and up Carabelle the same way. Pioneer. That was Joe Boston's place there in the West Fork. That was all a patented plastic creek claim. Right? Well, I was going to say, isn't this how the bell was founded in the first place? People just sort of worked their way up Comanche. Yeah. Creek doing little plastering, little plastering, and they finally followed it right to the main, right to the main so that yeah. That was probably the first mining done here then, wasn't it? Before they really got into anything. Yeah. Uh, John, why don't you tell them about the uh, stamp mill at the Black Hawk? Haven't you been doing well, I was going to say, why didn't somebody else here well, tell them about it? But you asked the question about how did they crush the ore, and we told you about a raster and stuff like that. In this part of the country, it wasn't really, just like in all the West, a major way to crush the, the ore was with these huge, great big uh, uh, iron boots that went up and down. And, and at black, stamp, stamp. Yeah, right, these great big huge boots. Mm -hmm. At Black Copper, which is just outside of town here, just past Winnie's, there's a magnificent five-stamp mill in absolutely beautiful shape, perfect shape. I mean, that thing would run tomorrow if we could get power to it. And, uh, the belt or surgery. It's beautiful. And there was one at the time mine had a stamp mill. Or wasn't there one just when we were talking about the Caraval had a stamp mill up yeah. there and they crushed their work with stamps. Myrtle, wasn't that a stamp too with a massive tub? No, no, no Myrtle. Just, just that was uh, crushed up and uh, where did they go? Crushed crushed the 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 <laughs> after the after it was crushed, you didn't do any separating, you just loaded it all up and you separated any at the mill? Oh yeah, so they had acid baths. Yeah, it separated by chemicals. At the meat, yes. And then, then your yeah. ore then was set to smelt. The caravels had pretty good vats up there. And the dry wheel, everything. Made pure gold out of rocks. And Molly, Molly Mine used ball mill for their final crushing of it. That's like that steel ball laying over there. And then it wears down to those little bitty ones and would come out of the end of a ball mill and a classifier would push the, the uh, steel or the unwanted rocks out of that right mm -hmm. into a bin or a different hopper and then the ore itself would go into another uh, little flume or little deal that they'd take down to the settling tanks. And then well, the linings of those mills were ceramic. It was made by Cooters. The Molly used to yeah. Yeah. Well, Molly, uh, like the Molly used brewery for their beer, but they're well, really yeah. for their ceramics. <laughs> yeah, iron, because I know the mailmen and guys had to work down in that uh, ball mill about once every year, year and a half. They had to reline it. They had the uh, plates that went inside that was bolted in there was about four inches thick, if I remember right. 
heavy. Yeah, but you that they were, my dad hated them. lifting those plates or handling them in there while they bolted them in inside the ball mill. You talk about that black copper reason that had good, good equipment for the milk company. Mm -hmm. Well, and again, it's a beautiful They had some shape. money, yeah. It's beautiful but shape. they had some money. They put in some good equipment. I'd like to ask you a question about this Keystone Mining District up here. We've been talking about Anchor and Midnight and the Bell, and that is just in the next canyon over from where we are right now. That map was drawn in 1895. And there, there are the street plans, so to speak, for those street towns. If that's the Keystone Mining District, why isn't Keystone on there? I don't know why they didn't, uh, why they called it more Midnight than they did the Keystone. I think the Midnight was just to claim in the Keystone Mining District. But so was the Edison. But, but Keystone is right in the middle of that and it doesn't even show. And I'm just real curious. Was why Keystone you, there in 1895 when they... Keystone was probably the beginning of the whole thing. The beginning of yeah. That's where they came mm -hmm. in from. And there are still foundations there. They're still in Abbott. I mean, there are spoils, wilds. It doesn't even show on that. So <laughs> I don't know. Do we know who drew the map originally? What company? or? Uh, it's on there. Uh, there is a map. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's the Keystone. I well, don't it doesn't show. It doesn't even have a map there. Nothing. No, it Land speculators. It's a map for them. It wasn't for miners. Well, and, and again, it's 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 idealized. None of those towns had that absolutely <laughs> square away on the guns. A lot of those buildings up there, they told me that uh, just the, the log frame of the building, that they had tent tops over the top of them. They never did finish the, the building. They just uh, used their tent top over the top and had mud chinked in the cracks, and they'd all, it had all washed out and all, and that's why the buildings were sitting there. Well, I'm pretty sure I've been to Keystone, but it's not very far from Anchor, <laughs> just a little bit north and a little bit to the to the east. I'm pretty sure I've been there. Yeah. But why the hell is it showing? It's the foundation for the whole district. I don't know. <laughs> That's amazing. What's the only question? Where's the cemetery on that map? Uh, which cemetery? <laughs> Midnight Cemetery. Midnight. Now me. Nobody had died yet. <laughs> <laughs> History of pollution that we're aware of today that from from all this work. But uh, Carabelle, that was a cyanide solution they used up there, as, as I know, in the black opera. They same way up there, but some of our cows picked it up for salt and died right there. They <laughs> didn't worry about that at that time. Yeah. They washed all down the river now. There was another big blaster mine right up there at the Narrows the Red River. That ditch that you can still see that comes out of Red River took the water around there, and in the bottom they had some of that hydraulic stuff like Carol was talking about to wash the gold. So all that wasted stuff went right down the river. Oh yeah, the river and that gold was that mine they called it the Carmichael Classic Classic. That big building that's still standing up there was their bunkhouse, and we lived in there for several years in the summertime, especially. My dad owned that all at one time, and the miners, they. That was their cook shack and everything. And then the, the two-story building it still is, I guess. And in the back room there, they didn't have steps. They had ladders to climb up. And on the steps where they climbed up for their nails on their shoes, they'd wore it in two on both sides of it where they climbed up. But that was the Carmichael plaster that it's come out from up the Red River. And up there where all those buildings are right now, above the Valley of the Pines. But Dad said that used to be Virginia City. They named it Virginia City there, and there wasn't anything on the record of that. So he said a whole bunch of buildings up there at that time. The Environmental Protection Agency has been in here the last couple of years uh, inventorying all these Placer and, and Pioneer and all these canyons. And uh, until the last election and until we lost so much money in this country, they were going to make us haul, we the Forest Service, they were going to make us haul all the tailings off. I mean, these mines are now draining, and uh, uh, I don't know about cyanide or anything like that, but the EPA thinks we've got some major problems. Uh, we, they don't even know it started well. well. They don't even know it started this wash up litter creek. They said the cattle started. Right? I think yeah. the Indians used to dance up there. I'd like to What do you say your name was? Time, so uh, Bob didn't drive all the way to listen Not to these stories. Oh, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> uh, does anyone have any questions about the older 
part of the mind? Carol will be glad to answer those questions. <laughs> Do any of the uh, Millette brothers, were they still, were they here when we all were younger, or were they <laughs> No, they're, uh, well, my grandfather used to buy milk from the Millette brothers. Yeah. Do they have anything to do with Our property up there where, where I am was uh, bought from the Millettes. From Warren Vet Millette, they were in Las Vegas, New Mexico at that time, and Mrs. Hermas, uh, the girl, the daughter of uh, George Millette, what was the Millette and Bobcat? George Millette. They used to own that place up there that uh, Robert Moops owns up there in the head of Bobcat. And the girls would ride the horses. Mrs. Hermas, who was in Las Vegas, I understand now she's moved. I don't know just where is Mrs. Hermas. Millettes are still in Las Vegas, Bob. Hmm? Millettes are still in Las Vegas. The granddad They're merchants. Well, anyhow, she she was one of the three girls that used to ride the old white horse down to the Red River Schoolhouse. And if the storms was bad, they'd come down and stay in that old log cabin of ours with their uncles, uh, Uncle Orrin and Uncle Vet and Millette. We have found one of the Millette daughters alive in California. She's 98, Francis. I think. 98 and living in Los Angeles. She came for the bicentennial. I can't remember her name, John. I was just was here a few years ago that I took back. I, I called Bob and got permission to take this. She, this woman was a child uh, that was born up uh, to Millette property that belongs to Johnny Gooch's cousin now. My granddad bought that from the Millette. From the Millette family, right. And okay. when she came back, then Rosemary and I took her and her some other folks back up in there to shore. She lived in, in L.A.? Uh, she lived in Los Angeles. That's, that's and her. Was, her. A, one of the brothers lived in uh, Las Vegas at that time. And his son still has a uh, mercantile business in Las Vegas. They've come up to visit within the last three months, six months. I'm a bad track of time, but yeah, they've come up and they're interested in the centennial. And okay, we're trying to. There's also a uh, a distant cousin or a, a, niece, a niece, I think, living in Albuquerque, who's coming up to visit here in the next month or so. And she, that's how we found out that the the daughter was still alive in L.A. And supposedly still very lucid and has a lot of memorabilia and hmm. photos and stuff. But I was just curious, like him, what when the Millet brothers themselves left? I mean, were they still here in the 30s well, or? They uh, they sold out. They sold that property to your granddaddy. Yeah. Uh, about just before World War One, didn't they, John? Oh yeah, before that, I think. They what he the reason they sold out. Mr. Millett and Mrs. Millett were educated as teachers, and they wanted their children to receive an education. So they moved to Las Vegas to Mexico because that was where they, they called it Mexico normal at that time for the school, so their kids could have an education. That was their primary. Okay. Are there any other questions before we turn it over to Bob? Bob? Where was the closest smelter after the order? The closest smelter? Well, one in town didn't work. <laughs> I think probably Colo uh, Pueblo, Pueblo, Colorado is where they shipped it to on the railroad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, at one time, no, they they shipped it out of uh, Rosa, Colorado, when the, it was closer. Well, I mean, the the railroad was discontinued into. Uh, you park. You park. Yeah, it, it was discontinued, and then they shipped it the other way. How'd you get there? And huh? How'd you get it to the railhead? Uh, truck, and, truck and wagon. The Molly Mine used trucks after after. Well, first they had the team and wagon, and then they had so much trouble with the horses and the freezing of the river. There was six river crossings between the Molly Mine and Cuesta, and then they bought uh, 1917 white trucks. And then the uh, Mortensen brothers, there was uh, old man Mortensen had uh, seven sons, and he then contracted the hauling from the Molly Mine, am I not right? Yeah. And uh, they had the baseball team. They even had their... <laughs> and Hillard Mortensen, one of the boys that drove the truck and played on the baseball team, was in the hospital the same time I was in Lahara. Old Hillard still, yeah, still alive. Are there any more questions? I have one story. When I went to school here, 
uh, in the seventh grade. Everybody was related. Except I wasn't related to them, or they weren't related to me, but they were related to each other. And the next year, Tony Simeon came along. So the two of us weren't related to everybody else, but we weren't related to each other. So we decided we'd try to pick everybody in school. <laughs> when you go in the old school up here, there's a entrance way, and you'd leave your lunch and your overshoes and your warm clothing out that hallway. And your lunch, the majority of the time you go to eat your lunch, the dessert would be gone. <laughs> so after Easter came and Tony and I learned about X-Lac and Easter Bunny. Little <laughs> <laughs> that sucker with X-Lac up the middle. And at two o'clock that knew we thought I'd been eating the first time. like in quartz. As I said, uh, there's enough gold in this, a pound of it today would be worth $75. But assay. These are some nuggets. A friend of mine, uh, well, had a claim up close to where uh, Al Gresslin had a claim. No, not Al. Uh, uh, who was the one who went up to Fair Play? Snell? Huh? Eddie Snell? Eddie Snell? Ed Snell. Yeah, Ed yeah. Snell. Well, this was a friend that had a claim up there next to Ed Snell in the Fairplay, and that's where those nuggets came from. And my nephew brought these three little nuggets back from Juneau, Alaska, when they went up there on a trip a few years ago. This is a piece of your fool's gold that shows you the difference in the color of iron pyrites, which is fool's gold, against looking at the quartz gold here. So anybody that wants to look at that, and these are the two nuggets that came out of the Aztec mine in the heel of some miner's shoe, I won't say who. <laughs> <laughs> but he still has it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Took out the shoes? <laughs> And if you're interested in these stories, they've been talking about uh, the Chamber of Commerce and the Red River Historical Society have these uh, brochures. This is on Placer Creek, and, and we have done it in conjunction with the, the Forest Service. Uh, this is on Placer Creek Mining History Trail. This one is on Pioneer Canyon, and it, it's numbered. It's You can drive along, and then it, the number corresponds with the tunnel. So these are available. Uh, this gives you a little brief history of Red River. Uh, this is available also. John brought his brochures. This is your tax money at work. It's the same as, uh, this is Placer Creek. If uh, we have books in the library, this is called Red River Twining. Uh, That's a good book, Judy. A New Mexico mining That's story. That's a good book, Jim. It's excellent. Uh, also, Mineral Resources of Taos County, was, which lists every mine. Uh, in this area, and it'll tell you a little bit about it. So, Bob, we're going to let you tell a little bit about Molly Mine. And then uh, he has a short film. It's only about, what, 10 minutes, did you say? I think so. And there's no sound to it. He's going to try to uh, uh, talk with it. But it's very, very interesting. So, you have the floor, sir. Uh, a lot of this, of course, has been touched on uh, back in the early days. They, uh, I think the first claims down there at Molly were in 1914, and uh, it was Fay and Johnson, and uh, I remember Fay, and I remember that name. Jimmy Fay. What about Wild Bill? You know who? Yeah, I claimed down here. That was before him. Was it called Wild Bill? The, uh, but Fay was the one, I think, that Jimmy Fay is the one that the Malignum Corporation bought the claims from. Yeah. And he bought a 1928 Dodge and coming back to Quest and Ingrid and one night turned it over down there and drowned, and drowned in the Red River. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
my dad bought the, bought the old Dodge then when I went up for sale. Sold our Model T to Cleve Horner in E-Town. Cleve drove that old Model T of ours back and forth to E-Town for, what, 20, 30 years? I don't know. Long time. Well, they had a, uh, they, they filed, I guess, uh, at least as far as I know, they filed the first claims down there of what became Molly, Molly Corp. And there was a, a fellow by the name of Sergeant that was in there. And he filed some claims in there along with Faith. And uh, the Sergeant, some, somewhere or another, there was a, an RNS mining company that was a predecessor, I believe, to Aluminum Corporation. And because in Back in 1919, there were, they had 40 some odd employees down there that were on the payroll. And that was before Molybdenum Corporation was ever formed. But uh, Sargent had a lot to do with uh, trying to work out, they were trying to find a use for this besides shoe polish. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, and he was instrumental in hiring a fella by the name of Marx Hirsch, that was a metallurgist back in New York. And to try to get Hirsch to develop some sort of a use for this black stuff that they had. And of course, when you look at it, it looks just like galena, like lead. You see the rock. And, uh, Bob or somebody brought a sample of it there, and you know you, you can rub it; it just rubs off on your hand. And the uh, Bob, what year was this? Well, prior to World War One. Yeah, it started out in 1914, and then you know they were working in 1919, and I've got an old time book here that starts out in 1919, but it doesn't. It doesn't have anything, uh, it doesn't tell the name of the mining company. But of course it has, you know, it's employees and like, you know, Bob says they were, in fact, Bob did better than the mules, you know, they, they were paying mules 60 cents a day down there. <laughs> Yeah. Well, then in, in, uh, in 19, somewhere around 1919 was when they hired this, this Marx Hirsch, and they started, you know, trying to put together a mine down there, and were, half, were serious about trying to find a use for this mine. They figured there had to be one. And, <coughs> and Hirsch went to, went back to Germany right after, after World War One, and he brought back uh, a bunch of steel samples that uh, from Germany, and he brought them back to this country, and he analyzed them, and he found out that the Germans were using molly as an alloy, steel. So all of a sudden, you know, they were onto something. So they formed the Lipinum Corporation of America, and that was formed in 1921. And uh, Marx Hirsch and several others that were involved in the company for many, many years were uh, a part of that, you know, the original Lipinum Corporation. And uh, Mr. Carmen, they brought Mr. Carmen in. Uh, now the story I heard was a little bit different than the one that Bob told, but uh, the uh, but the, Carmen had been in mining a little bit. He was down in Mexico when he got run out during the revolution and came up here. Uh, he might not have been down there very long, but uh, he got run out and came up here to this country and he went to work for Molly Corp. There, I, I would think they probably said if you can get this mill running. Uh, we'll, we'll give you a job 
permanent job. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, they, they used, uh, at first, as they said, they used the old mill as an old gold mill. It was there, <coughs> it was there at Jeepo. And they hauled the ore up to that. And then in 1923, they built their own mill down there at, uh, at the old Bali site. And well, that 23 was the year it went into full production. Down there, wasn't it? Yeah, that's there's a, that's, uh, they had the mill ready to run in, in the winter of 22. There was no place for the miners or anybody to stay, so they just shut it down then until spring. That, that's, uh, that's what it'll be. Carmen and them told me at the east, and then Dad was, of course, helping. He had help to build the mill. And, and old man Creel and the boys, Bob Creel, built the flume, yeah. worked on the flume. And, the, uh, you know, it, 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 and it's kind of interesting that the, the uh, you know, some of the people that were involved there, like in 1919, was Bert Fimps, who worked down there for the Living Corporation. Uh, the uh, 1920 was Walter Jenkins. And Walter Janney hauled lots of the uh, uh, mine timbers and stuff. Did he? Yeah, I kind of wanted them. Yeah. Walter and Herbert. But, you know, well, there's a guy that made a dollar a day. His name wasn't uh, Bob. His name was Gus. <laughs> But, uh, you know, and apparently Molly Mine paid pretty good because some of them were drawing $3.75 a day. Back that, then. Is, that was a miner. Yeah, that's what a miner got paid. Uh, the guy that ran the drilling machine. Jack, <coughs> Jack Munden, Bert Zips, yeah. Gus Halsey, Rapp, Thompson, Frank Riley. Jack Munden started the Riverside Camp over here. The ghost of Jack. Oh. Well, Riley's in here from the Buffalo. Is it? Some of his stuff in there in his receipt book, Riley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Albert, Albert Phipps. Was he eleven? Ted Bert. Oh, Ted Bert. Albert. Oh, that's oh, that's Bert. Yeah, okay. that's not Bert Fitz. Okay. But uh, you know, and, and here, you know, in 1920, why they, you know, they had a lot of people working. Well, Bernhardt's were down there. Mm -hmm. you know, Bernhardt had the cabin down there in the mouth of the sulfur so gold gold. there on a little flat place, yeah, and then he had to claim up spring gold there. Going up the mine, up the sulfur gold there before you got the blinds over, what they call spring gold. Bernhardt had several claims in there. Yeah. The, uh, but, you know, just a lot of these names. Marcelino Martinez looked like he went to work down there about 1922. Uh, he had the wood and he had the wagons. You know, he used to let us kids ride up on uh, ore wagons to my house to the ore bins up in Sulphur Gulch, and when they brought the wagons down, why, he had some <coughs> shovel. We had to help shovel it out of the wagon into the ore bin so they could get it down to the mill. And they had, uh, I don't know if you got a picture of it, but anyway, the highway came up over the hill, and the ore bin was on the low side. The commissary and office building was there on the left. And between those two was where we shoveled in. Then they took a little ore car. And raised the gates and the ore would slide out. The bin had a slope with the bottom to it, would slide out into the ore car and take it around and dump it into the crusher at the mill. Then from the crusher, a conveyor belt took it over and dumped it into the hopper to the ball mill. When it came out of the ball mill, it was so fine it would go through a 300 mesh screen. And that's the concentrates in that little bottle that Judy set down there. That's what they shipped out, the refined ore it came out of that rock. And that's Concentrates. Yeah. Uh, when you just over. 
Are there any records of what kind of production came out of those mines in the early days in terms of dollar and cents figures? Uh, I'm sure there were, but I don't. I don't have them. Before World War II, the entire output of this mill went to Antwerp, Germany. The sacks were labeled right down here. The sacks weighed about, uh, well, somewhere between 80 and 100 pounds. A little sack about yay big around, about yay high. It was real heavy. And uh, they labeled, use no hooks, Antwerp, Germany, via New York. And the entire output that they shipped. And they were heavy. I helped them too. <laughs> uh, Those old miners literally hand carved the ore out. They just followed the veins. Yeah. And some of those stopes were like 200 feet high by 150 feet long and only be about three feet wide if you could imagine working in a space like that. Mm -hmm. One of my first projects they assigned me down there was to see if any of those old workings presented a hazard to the... Well, when I was down there, it was a, a surface mine, an open pit mine, and they wanted to know if the workings presented a hazard to the trucks and shovels. <laughs> and they had surveys of these workings, and if you could imagine taking a handful of earthworms and dropping on a bucket, and then somehow plotting the path that earthworm took through the bucket. Well, that's the way those old tunnels <laughs> left through there. Wound around everywhere. <laughs> yeah, they were and no, they didn't present a hazard to the <laughs> trucks and shovels. <laughs> there were several hundred miles of tunnel down there. Yeah. 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 But yeah. they were all quite tiny. And uh, mm -hmm. you take the old Z tunnel, what if uh, the first part of Z went back 2,100 feet, right, to the first mm -hmm. shaft? Mm -hmm. And then they put down a shaft 250 feet deep. Uh, they call it the 200 foot level because 50 foot of that was sunk in the bottom where they pumped the, where the water would accumulate and they pumped the water out. If anything happened or the pump shut down, why there was a warning went out and all the miners that was in the tunnels that went off from this shaft had to get out and get up because it would fill with water. And you had to and get out. Then they went back another from that uh, 200 foot level, they went back then another uh, 1,800 feet, I believe, toward yeah, Gold Hill or something like that, and put down another 250 foot shaft, they call it the 500 foot level. And that's where the tunnel down the uh, Red River Canyon went in and connected with the 500 foot level to drain the water out so they didn't have the problem of getting, pumping the water out up through the upper workings. And they also used it as a haul tunnel then to bring the ore out so they didn't have to hoist it back up and take it out through Z tunnel. Right? They, they put that in, I think, what, 41, 42? Yeah. Uh, well, no, that was before that because I worked in that tunnel down there. And, and uh, uh, well, it started out as a miner and then uh, uh, Gwen put me on the um, electric mule or the electric motor. And that was all before World War II because uh, when uh, war was declared, I enlisted and quit. And we'd already gone back and they were sinking the shaft back in that time. Was it pretty hazardous to work in those tunnels back then? Oh, to a certain extent, uh, you had to watch where you timbered through the soft spots. I went in the old Z tunnel and a month after I was in there, it caved in. <laughs> and they would talk about these raises. I don't know yeah. if it's true, but they had a raise they called the Big John Raise. But like they had the John raises and the ore would slide down a chute down one of the old tunnels down, and there would be a bin there that would hold it. And uh, that's why they used Z Tunnel as a main haul tunnel, and they could uh, raise the gates and slide the ore right out into the cars, and that's the one the mule pull the whole string of cars out where one person or one man could just push one car. And the tunnels always had a slope to them uphill so that uh, the water would run out of the tunnel. And alongside of the track there was always a stream of water that would run out. It was drippy and wet. How many, year, how many years or how many times has the mine been shut down for various reasons since it was opened up? I don't think it was ever 100% shut down uh, until uh, 
until you know, till this last quarter. Yeah, uh, it was always on to some extent. Something was going on. But anyhow, the, a lot of the, the, the power for the mill was furnished by, they talked about the wooden flume. Uh, they took water out of the river. They ran it through a wooden flume that ran along the hillside down there and, and down through some pipes into the mill. And there was an old Pelton water wheel down there in the mill. The turbine, the, wasn't it? In the, encased in the big steel housing? Hit the turbine? Yeah, maybe it was. It hit the turbine out of those uh, the big pipes. They were 18 or 20 inch pipes and they narrowed down to a three inch nozzle that went into the turbine down there in the bottom of the mill. And I always heard that they, they hauled that wheel over from Twining. Probably did. And uh, that old water wheel came from Twining. So, and the other engine that they had down there was an old Benz engine that came from Germany that had been a ship engine. And they used the water wheel to get this flywheel turning on this Benz engine. And it was a diesel. And you lit it with a paper cartridge. It looked like a, a cigarette. And you lit this paper, you raised a little door, you threw that paper cartridge in there, and you hoped that it would fire off. <laughs> and, the, uh, and, and so most of the milling that was done in the early days was done during the summertime when they had the water power from the river. And of course, there were a lot of people that you know lived there in the camp. But if we go take a quick look at this film, why it kind of starts out, I think, where Mr. Hirsch was going to Europe after the war, because the ship that they're on is a World War One ship that still has some of the guns that they they had on there for submarines and whatnot. And uh, then it. You know, it carries on and it probably runs through into the 20s uh, where they were hauling some more out and like that. But the, uh, it's interesting. It, it just is a, And on the end of the shaft from that uh, turbine, they had an electric generator. Right. And they generated their own electricity for the mill, the schoolhouse, and the office, the bunkhouse, the boarding house, and then the three... Uh, off of, uh, well, the uh, mill superintendent and Mr. Epley's house and Mr. Carmen's house all had electricity. Mm. I know those kids used to have to shovel coal to get warm in the morning. They didn't have any power generating that. <laughs> no, no, I have been that. You didn't use it, hardly used an electric clock down there because you know, there was no, it was hard to find 60 cycles. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and we'll try to explain that thing a little bit. Can we get the uh, neons off here?
and then the old cookhouse. <laughs> they had a cookhouse there. Yes. And that, I'm sure, was taken up for gold. And the most thing you do at that time, you know. <laughs> And they, they shipped the ore out of uh, out of the Rosa up there. They used to bring their fuel oil in there. That's a question. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we're going up to South Dakota. And some of the old uh, mine operations are up there in South Dakota. Thank you. 